So the first thing I wanted to remind you of is the independent variable is usually the x value. And the dependent value variable is the y value. And when I'm thinking about like a real world problem, like input, like uh, whatever you are imagining doing, you put that number in and then you, you do an operations to it and that's when you get your answer out. So like if you were say renting a boat per hour and then you would want to know how much you're going to pay for the total, well hours is your input and money is your output. Um, yeah, I want to rent a boat. That sounds like fun. Okay, so also wanted to remind you of uh, radical functions and then our um, conic sections. So uh, conic sections are the parts of a cone um, that can be seen when you have a light that shines on the cone. And so um, I went over it in, in class in Math 2 plus and that was a long time ago. Circles, ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbola, hyper, hyperbolas, hyperbolas are the four conic sections that we're interested in. And I want to talk about um, parabolas first because if you take a, par a parabola, y equals a times x minus h quantity squared plus k, this is vertex form of a parabola, that's great. Um, what is the inverse of a parabola? Because inverses is the topic that we're working on right now. Let's talk about inverses really quickly. So I have this and I have my vertex form of a parabola. And let me just start by talking about a single point, okay? Say I have this point and what point is that? Let's call it A. And when I look at A, I'm thinking that A lives at 0, 1. Um, 0 is the input value and 1 is the output value. And sometimes when I say output, I'll actually write down the word height of the graph. Right? It's always nice to remember that output values, Y values are supposed to be a height. And uh, particularly when we're working with real world, world problems, it's useful to think of it as a height. So A is at a height of 1. And if I wanted to transform this using inverses, do you remember what to do? I'm hoping that you remember that we're supposed to flip x and y. So I would have a 1 and a 0 as a point. And this would be called my point a prime. a prime would live here. And you're like, oh, OK, so hmm, I wonder if this has some sort of relationship. And it turns out that there is totally a relationship. Say, for example, that I wanted to take this point like uh, negative 1 and 1, which would be right here, and I would call this point B, and I transform it using inverses, I would get 1 and negative 1. So 1 and negative 1 goes like this. So that's B, and this is B prime. And now you're starting to see the pattern, and do you remember what it is that happened? Well, what happens is that no matter what the point is, if you inverse it, what you are going to find is that it is a mirror image across this line. And this line is an extremely important line to me. It is the line y equals x. Okay? And that line y equals x, why does it mirror across that line? Well, because if you take a point that lives on this line, like say you take 0, 0, and I'm going to call this my point C, 0, 0's inverse is just 0, 0. In fact, I could pick this point 1, 1, and that would be point D, and 1, 1 also just gets mapped exactly into 1, 1. So this is my C prime and this is my D prime, and I've, I've graphed them, and so it's really kind of boring to talk about the inverse of things that are on the line. But anything else makes like sort of this mirror image, and it's really pretty. So what would it look like then if I actually used a whole parabola here? Not just point A, but actually a, a, a whole parabola, and I wanted to inverse it. Well, it turns out that I remember how parabolas have this tendency to go up one and, uh, up one and over one, and then up three and over one up one and over one, up three and over one. 
And I wonder if you remember that pattern. If you don't, remind me in class and we'll talk about it. So if I wanted to find the inverse, well, we already found the inverse of a, that's a prime. But I'm going to mention that it's going to go up one and over one in the same fashion, but like a mirror, okay? So that is your mirror of a parabola, the inverse. And algebraically, if we look at it, what is the equation of this pink parabola? I'm pretty sure that this pink parabola's uh, vertex form would actually just be x squared plus 1, specifically because... It's just a regular shaped parabola. You remember I used to call it the mother of all because I'm a mother, but some, some teachers might call it the parent function or the basic function, and it's been translated up by 1 because at the end I had this plus 1, and this plus 1 moves every value up 1. Well, what would this, this red one be then? Well, what you'll see is I'm reviewing inverses, and I'm hoping that you remember that I don't want to, you know, individually move points when I'm looking at uh, a whole function that I'm going to take an inverse of. It's kind of boring. I want to do algebra on it to make that, you know, that, that inverse pop out at me. So the process for finding an inverse, which we are reviewing again, is that you swap x and y, and then you solve for the new position of y, okay? So this is just to find an inverse. Step one, swap x and y. Step two, solve for y. So I take y equals x squared plus one. I'm gonna swap x and y. I'm gonna get x equals y squared plus one. And then I wanna, you know, hmm, solve for y. And so I'm thinking I'd like to move this plus one. So I'm gonna minus one and minus one. And so now I have a y squared, and that equals x minus 1. And I'm going to take the square root now. And I, always, I wonder if you remember, I used to tell you, take the square root in a different color. Because as soon as you do, you will remember to put that plus sign or that minus sign down. And this gives you y equals, right, because the square root of y squared is just y. y equals positive or negative uh, square root of x minus 1. And this is my inverse of the original. So this is the inverse. And now you hopefully remember that sideways parabolas are called radical functions. Radical functions. You know, functions that have square roots in them. And in class, we're going to talk about translating them. But for now, I have reviewed for you how to find them. Here's the part that's the tricky part. There's a plus side of this function, and there is a minus side of this function. And when you look at the graph, it is not always immediately obvious to students where the plus side and the minus side go. This is the plus side, and this is the minus side. And that's how we deal with stuff in calculus when we need it to be a function. So if I talk about just the top half, the top half by itself is a function, and the bottom half by themselves are functions. Individually. And that's why you might be handed something in a calculus class that's a square root. Okay? Instead of me giving you, say, this little beauty and asking you to graph it, um, I might, you know, flip it. I could have flipped it and handed you this guy. And that could have been what you put into Desmos. Because Desmos will definitely graph this, by the way. X equals Y squared plus 1. You can just throw that into Desmos and it'll tell you what that shape is. But then the other operations that we want to do using calculus are a little bit more difficult to use in that format. So that's why in a calculus problem, you might be given this guy instead. Like, hey, we solved it for y for you already. Aren't you feeling grateful? <laughs> you might not, but that is why we do it, okay, is that it sometimes makes it easier for us to do something like take a derivative or do an integral uh, once you learn how to do those things. So we're just reviewing the basics of, you know, math two right now. 
And I wanted to remind you that not only did I give you the you know uh, radical functions in that class and ask you to learn how to find the inverses, radical functions are inverses of parabolas. They look like this shape, or they sorry, or they look like that shape, and they're sideways parabolas. But also, you could take the equation of a circle or the equation of ellipse, and you can also solve that for one variable. So I want to show you what a circle looks like when I solve for y, okay? And do you remember the equations for such things? Um, it's, it's x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And do you remember the basic function was x minus h quantity squared, y minus k quantity squared, and r being squared. And so that tells you how wide this guy is, and it also tells you where its center is at. And if you've got a binder for me, then you have a formula sheet about circles, ellipses, and everything. I printed it out for you. You might remember it from my class. So what if I told you that I had x minus 1 quantity squared plus y plus 2 quantity squared equals, I don't know, how about the square root of 20? Like, oh no, square root of 20. I don't know what that is. Yeah, you probably don't, and you may not even remember how to simplify it. But the square root of 20 is definitely smaller than the square root of 25, which is 5. And it's also definitely bigger than the square root of 16, which is 4. So just remember this. The square root of 16 equals 4. Square root of 25 equals 5. So square root of 20, somewhere in here. Okay, so that means it's a width that's a little bit bigger than 4. Maybe it's close to 4.5, I don't know. We could grab a calculator and figure it out. But right now, I'm not, I'm not focused on that. I don't even care about that. What I'd like to do is solve for y. And I just wanted you to see a, these steps. I'm going to minus x minus 1 quantity squared from both sides. X minus 1 quantity squared from both sides. I get y plus 2 quantity squared equals the square root of 20 minus x minus 1 quantity squared. It's ugly, but it can be done. And now I'm going to pull out that second color, just like I reminded you you should do, and I'm going to take the square root of both sides, and I'm going to end up with, ready, y plus 2, because remember, the square root of something that is squared is just that thing. It just comes down and no longer has a squared around it anymore. And then this little business here is super ugly. Guess what? You cannot simplify this any further. Not at this point, nor would you want to. What you can do, though, is you can graph it. And I would actually go ahead and minus 2 from both sides. And I'm going to give you a final answer is that y equals, ready, negative 2 plus minus the square root of the square root of 20 minus x minus 1 quantity squared. It's ugly, it's scary, and you don't know how to graph it. But I will be able to teach you how to take the derivative of it. I know, right? Crazy. How could that possibly be true? And I, I, I wanted to make sure that I did one that was super hard so that you couldn't, couldn't remember that it's possible. But I'd also like to talk about one that we could actually graph and take a look at. So let me do one more, and this one's a little bit easier, okay? And I'm going to draw a line right here that we are solving for y. This is my first step. This is my second step. This is my third step, and this is my answer right here. All right, what if I did one more example and I'm just going to do something simple. I'm probably going to slow down here. You guys are better at organizing your notes than I am. Example is like x squared plus y squared equals 9. Okay, that's something I could do, Ms. Chatra. Uh, yes, of course it is. If you minus x squared from both sides, then what you're going to end up seeing is y squared equals 9 minus x squared. Oh, yeah, this is easy. I'm going to take the square root. I'm going to take the square root. I get the plus sign. I get the minus sign. 
I have the square root of 9 minus x squared. And yes, again, I will mention, there's nothing you can do to the interior of this function in order to make it look prettier. It doesn't need to be factored. I know I could factor it, you could factor it, but we don't want to. It doesn't make it easier to deal with, okay? When it comes down to taking the derivative of it, we're going to want to keep it exactly the way it is. But also, I'd like to talk about the graph of it really quick because I want to mention, again, that there is a top half and a bottom half to this beautiful thing. So imagine that my radius is something squared, right? R squared equals 9. So if I take the square root, I get that r equals positive and negative 3, but I don't need the negative because this is a distance, right? I go out to 3, I go out to 3, I go out to 3, and I go out to 3, and I didn't really draw this line big enough to go all the way out to 3, but there you go. And don't be mad at me if I pull out my, my circle tool because I'm really bad at drawing circles, so I really actually want to have a circle tool here so that it can make it look like it's a circle. Hey, that's pretty close, actually. That's pretty close. So you'll forgive me if it's not exact because even in the interest of time, I'm going to cheat. Oh, hey, that's pretty good. So what I need you to know is that this plus side is this top half of this circle. So whenever you see a square root with a number minus, you know, an x squared, ah, you should be thinking that's the top half of a circle. And then the bottom half of the circle is this minus sign right here, and it's this bottom part. So if you were to be asked to graph it, or at least, you know, mentally you're trying to think about what shape you're dealing with, now you have some sort of clue on how to visualize that, okay? Ellipses are even more complicated. Feel free to review them on um, Khan Academy. Ask me for a video or something like that. Now, as far as function notations go and function compositions go, um, I did find you a video. So this is you should check on the master flip list. There's a couple of videos to help you with this, and I just wanted to mention it here. But function compositions is something that, um, that I really want to review. So see below. I don't have enough room to write what I wanted to write. Here we go. So I'm going to draw a little line here because I'm moving on into my new topic, which is function compositions. And if I have two functions, I have f of x equals x minus 3 quantity squared. You know, 3 is on my mind because we just did a problem like that. g of x is going to be 2x plus 5. And I want to compose them. There are two ways that you can compose them. And specifically, I want to remind you that in my class, I really let you focus on this one first. And here I'm going to show you with some pretty colors here. That if I write g of x inside of f of x, I think you might recall how easy it is to put g into f. The problem is when I write it this other way, and maybe I should have this be black, and I should have this be black, and I should have that be black, and you might forget that this is called the composition symbol. The problem with me as a teacher was that I let you focus on this, and that you cheat. You're like, oh, G is inside of F. I got it. I need you to be able to focus on this now that we're in calculus because you will see this on the test. At one point or another, one problem, multiple choice problem, will end up having an F composed with a G. And what you have to remember to do is to take the F function. Both of these things are equal, by the way. I made them equal on purpose. And here I'm actually about to do the work to show you what happens when you take F of X and you plug in what g of x is. Ready? g of x is 2x plus 5. Now these interior parentheses, I don't really re need them. Remember I have 2x plus 5 minus 3, which means I'm allowed to combine like terms here and get 2x plus 2, and that is what is being squared. And guess what? Calculus, we don't expand. Do not expand that. I don't need you to. Don't factor it either. I know how to factor it, and you might make a mistake. If you factor it wrong, you will not get the right, um, the right number. 
When I factor this, I get 2 times x plus 1, and the whole thing is squared. And then when I factor it, I say that 2 is squared, and I say that x plus 1 is also squared. So the constant that I get at the beginning is a 4, not a 2. You thought that we were going to end up with a 2 in front. That's why I tell you not to factor. So don't factor. And don't expand. And I'm about to draw a line through it. Don't do those things, okay? Now that was F composed with G, and I'd like you to try G composed with F. Send me an email. Let me know that you got it done uh, with the answer, and I will give you five points of extra credit. I will give you another five points of extra credit if you took notes while you did this video. So five points of extra credit for notes and five points of extra credit for finishing G composed with F. Find G composed with F of this and send me an email on it. There should be rewards when you do extra work.